Um, I'm Hernán Díaz Alonso, the director of SciArc. Uh, it is my true pleasure and honor to introduce Bruce Sterling tonight. Um, Bruce is here, of course, to lecture tonight, but also he's conducting the master class, which is uh, an ongoing program already a couple of years that was initiated by Tom Wiscombe, our undergrad chair who has you have a remarkable track record, Tom. It's going to be difficult to keep it up. But he managed with the team to keep figuring out how to bring these extraordinary thinkers to the school. And, and, and this is, of course, no exception. Uh, I, I put some notes. Usually, I don't write any notes. But I want to be precise, because I think Bruce Sterling is actually a crucial figure in many of the things that um, we are obsessed in discussing, in discussing these days in the school, and I think in culture at large. Um, there are not that many individuals that have the capacity to create different conditions and words and moments in contemporary culture, um, in the intersection between, let's say, popular culture and mainstream, mainstream culture and high culture, like Bruce does. So j just, just to, to give you a sense of some of the things that I'm, I'm trying to address here is Bruce is, is, is considered one of the true pioneers and founders of the silver punk as a genre inside the science fiction. And I'm pretty sure, like any great writer like himself, he don't like so much of those things to be defined those terms. Um, of course, this started probably with his Mirror Shade trilogy. Um, but it's not just that he's a writer. He's been an editor of multiple, multiple publications, which is also a crucial thing, how not only to write, but how to edit content. Um, he's also a blogger, and he started doing this way before that blogging with, was what it is today. He blogs at Be Beyond the Beyond, which is hosted by Wire, and he's, of course, a provocateur at large. Um, but one of the things that I think it makes his presence in Sire so relevant is because he has thrown into the culture, in the culture at large, but particularly in the culture of architecture, and particularly in the microculture of SIARC, certain terms and concepts that we appropriate and we use all the time, like the idea of design fiction, which is associated with world building. And we know how much we talk about this, but clearly he was talking about some of these concepts way before many of us understood or we were paying attention to it. Um, of course, they have other concepts that have to do with what are the new forms of truth, but ultimately what have to do with a production of realities and multiple realities. It has been said many times that science fiction is not really so much about predicting the future, but it's always a commentary of the times that we live in. And in the times that we are, and we are right now, it's an interesting moment for us to reflect what is the condition of what we understood traditionally, historically, and right now the notion of science fiction. Is science fiction already really some alternative reality, or the reality has become in such in which science fiction is really becoming some form of documentary, or some form of contemporary journalism of commentary? These are a really extraordinary times in which the creation and proliferation of multiple realities, multiple truth, or the no clarity what remains truth anymore, is a challenge. And I think that always is a challenge for a writer. And it's always a challenge for somebody who seeks some form of approximation to that. So I can really not imagine that many characters that are much more suited to discuss the contemporary crossover of culture than we are. So I'm really looking forward to what Bruce have to say tonight, but also what he will be doing with you guys, or I've been doing with in the master class. So is with great happiness and great pleasure that I what, welcome is not the right word because I don't want him to feel that welcome because I want to create some friction. But please, for the time being, welcome. 
join me to welcome Bruce Sterling to SIARC. Yeah, thanks for coming to see me. It's good to see you out there in the darkness. So, um, yeah, this is uh, the, uh, the market solution to embroidery problems here. And uh, I want to wax a bit futuristic tonight. I'm going to talk about architecture in 30 years. Uh, 30 years, good long span of time. Uh, you know, and, and why that long? Well, you know, I, I like the idea of not being around. Now, this is like casting things that are beyond my own statistical lifetime. And this enables me to have kind of a, a calmer, more philosophical, disengaged, and frankly, not very guilty feeling about how things are turning out. You can't really forecast things at a 30-year distance. It's just too far to go. But you can, you can dream, and you can look at it. And you know the fact that I might not live to see it doesn't really bother me that much. I feel just the same way about the 2040s, the late 2040s, the 2050s, the middle of the 21st century, as I do about the 1920s, which were 30 years before my birth. And you know, 30 years is a good long distance, but I think the 1920s have a lot to teach us, and there was plenty to go on, going on, and you ought to be open-minded about it and kind of try and understand why things in the 1920s were they are the way they were and you know what makes them of interest and kind of what it means in the big picture and so forth. So you just have to look past these notions of mortality and recognize that the 2040s and the 2050s, well, it's a time when a baby born today is 30, so he's having some kind of age crisis. But also the students in the room are people who are in their 50s. And they're kind of gray-haired, well-established conventional figures who know what's going on. I mean, when you're in your 50s, you're kind of a judgmental figure, you're a seasoned guy, you're somebody people trust with common sense. So, you know, when you're actually in the 2040s and the 2050s, if you're a student in SciArc today, this is a day when people are really gonna expect you to know what's going on. I mean, you're gonna be like the source of the conventional wisdom. So, you know, I, I wanna talk about what architecture might be like at that period. And you know, there, there's always a lot going on in architecture. So I'm going to try and concentrate on the things that I think people might be enthusiastic about, even like foolishly overjoyed by. It's like, what would, be, what, what would they be really, really impressed about? I mean, like, what would be their version of like Los Angeles space age googie architecture? I mean, not the stuff that's like making money and kind of getting the awards and, you know, you're angling for the Pritzker with this, but, you know, the stuff that's like really far out and kind of groovy by the notions of 30 years from now. And I'm pretty sure that people 30 years from now will be just as foolish as us. I don't expect them to be any wiser or any better subtle. I think they're going to have vogues, manias, frenzies. They'll get carried away by stuff. They'll get wrapped up in their own dreams. But I'm interested in the stuff that might happen in architecture that people of my generation or previous generations would just never see at all. I mean, what's the things that's like on the table for them that's never been on the table for anybody else before? So, you know, why do I find this approach of interest? Well, this is me back in the heyday of Wired Magazine and the boom, dot-com 1990s, being sent around the world, literally, at Wired Magazine's expense to see all the biggest, freakiest architectural developments on the planet at that time, which I proceeded to do and, and wrote it up. And you know, I, after that experience, I came to understand the mania in architecture. Uh, you know, and the kind of grandiosity and the science fictional qualities of it. Um, you know, here's a gentleman who's a uh, architecture writer who uh, died this, this, uh, this month. And, you know, the thing I like about his kind of approach to this problem and like learning from Las Vegas is that if you see what people say about Robert Venturi and what he said during his long career of architecture criticism, they say things like, you know, 
I've got to go back and reread all of Robert's books. And I'm sure they're like messages there we missed. He's like, he's saying things that we have to go back to the roots like he did and kind of like, you know, you know take inspiration from his wisdom. Okay, and you just never hear that said about other kinds of futurists. I mean, even though he was writing about the future of architecture and where he thought it ought to go, uh, you know, and, and kind of large scale trends, um, if you're a science fiction writer and you die like Robert Venturi, you're left in this situation of like, oh yeah, he was like that weird guy who thought we'd be living in space bubbles by now. I mean, you're always hooked to some particular grand fad or kind of, you know, engorged, top-heavy sci-fi notion, whereas a guy like Venturi is actually considered a figure for the ages and kind of solemn and grand. And this is something I really appreciate about architecture. I think it's something precious to this particular profession, and it's something you have to be careful not to lose. I mean, it's been my experience that when you, when you talk to an architect about the tenor of the times, kind of the grand scheme of things, it's like, what does life mean nowadays? It's like, what's really happening in the built environment? He's always got something wise and convincing to say. It's like, even though they are kind of obsessed by fads underneath, I mean, architects have a sci-fi side, you know, nevertheless, that when you actually sort of put them under the spotlight and they're like, trying to convince somebody to pony up 250 million for a 10-year megastructure. They're really kind of calm and convincing about it, and that's something I really envy and admire and want to copy. Uh, you know, even though I'm, I'm aware of their mania, and I think there's going to be manias in the, in the future, and I think there's going to be some wild stuff happening. So, you know, obviously, really big stuff is always big deal in the architectural profession. Because, you know, every architect has a chair in his soul. So, you know, first he wants to build a piece of furniture. But then he's got the chair, he has to think about the room. And once he's got the room, he has to think about the house. And once he's done the house, he wants to do an apartment building. And having managed the apartment building, he wants to get into city planning and maybe do a block. And having done a few blocks and maybe an art district, he's going to like ramp up. It's like, OK, why don't we like plan the whole town? And you know, given the town, why don't I go to the state house and like try to do some stuff about, you know, and then I'm like, OK, I'm like, why not like the nationwide railway system? OK, this is, makes perfect sense to me. You know, I, I understand why, I understand the allure of that. You know, I don't blame architects for wanting to do it. I mean, architects are super about the command of space. It just, you know, okay, it's like block 10, 100, 1,000. It's like, yeah, you know, it's like, sure. And, you know, and, and I see a lot of them, and I've sort of been to a lot of them, really. So, you know, this is the cover of me doing my tiny mega thing, and I'm like the tiny guy next to the gigantic architectural megastructure. But you know, there's kind of a lot of those around. And the stuff I was writing about in the 1990s, a lot of it was set in China. I was at the Cheplak Kok Airport. I was in one of the giant dam buildings. I was in Shanghai Pudong, watching them try to erect the tallest skyscraper on Earth at the time. Quite a small, modest building by the standards of contemporary super talls. But I did not see stuff like this. Like, this notion that the Chinese would attempt to go out and terraform this huge tongue of ocean out in the middle of nowhere, or you know, go for this kind of gigantic Eurasian and African transportation system, uh, you know, which I could see them doing in the 1990s, but this is just like much more upscale. You know, and this is just one of the many islands that the Chinese have terraformed wholesale in the, uh, in, in the South China Sea. This is. Um, fiery reef, as the Americans call it, and naturally the Chinese have some patriotic name for it. But you know, this is basically a military fortress, which was a, you know, a semi-submerged coral atoll, and they just used the same techniques that were used by uh, Norman Foster in the Cheplap Cop Airport, just dredge up stuff and just start piling it on there and like put geotextiles on top of it and really just hammer it in, I mean, like all modern conveniences. They got like the barracks, you know, soccer fields. You know, you could, you could land a 747 on this thing. You know, it's bigger than, it's a big solid aircraft carrier. You know, it's a Chinese fortress just out in the middle of nowhere. Okay, you know, this is the power of autocracy. 
and the kind of grandiosity, grandiosity of autocracy, of people who can command what they're doing. Okay, this is a NATO power here. This is Turkey. This is Erdogan, who's the current supremo in Turkey. So, you know, he had some economic problems quite recently. He realized that, like, the markets were going to um, upset his control over the Turkish economy. So he just appointed himself, the guy who appoints himself, to a guy who appoints himself <laughs> as, as now the supreme commander of the Turkish National Wealth Fund, which is $200 billion, right? So he's giving himself permission to give himself permission to give himself permission to seize more or less personal command over $200 billion worth of Turkish NATO money. You know, and what is he going to do with this sum? Well, you know, he's probably going to do what Nazarbayev here was doing in, in Kazakhstan, which is kind of part of the pan-Turkic zone. He just builds a new city out of nowhere, Astana. You know, and I have been to Astana. I mean, I took this picture in Astana, and that's one of Lord Norman Foster's grandiose things there, that kind of gigantic Central Asian tent. And, uh, you know, you got to give Norman credit. I mean, a Cheplak Cock, fantastic airport. And if you need a Central Asian thing that's going to, like, capture the attention of former wandering guys in yurts, you know, a multi-story, gigantic Central Asian yurt is pretty well going to get the thing covered. You know? And, you know, the, and I was talking to people in Astana. They were, they were astonished. <laughs> You know, they, they did not realize what would happen if somebody just kind of cut loose with the oil spigot and just started getting star architects to build anything that the oil could pay for. Uh, but, you know, they were pleased. I mean, they, they did not understand that they needed a mega city in the middle of nowhere. I mean, just, just out in the steps, there's no particular reason for this city to be where it is, except that it's not where the other cities in Kazakhstan used to be. But it was a deliberate attempt to just like create a clean slate, you know, a kind of year zero for a new kind of Central Asian nationalism. And just like, if we don't spend the money on something, we're just gonna, we'll be overtaken. You know, it's like, we have to, we have to invest, we have to do it. And they said, you know, we, we didn't believe we could do it, and now we're, like, living a money. And I was like, I've got a pretty nice apartment, and everything's kind of shiny and new and grand. And, you know, I don't, I don't disguise the fact that it's an autocracy, but it's really one of the most interesting places I've ever been. And, you know, and, and in some ways, its sinister aspect is really alluring. You know, and it's one of the few, it's one of the rare cities that, like, sprang out of nowhere during my lifetime and has a kind of off-kilter vitality that's hard to describe. You know, and it's, and it's not commercial, right? And it's not global. It's kind of nationalistic, but not entirely nationalistic. It has elements of a dictatorship, but it also has kind of the Albert Speer grandiosity. You know, there's something about it that really does capture the imagination. And I've always felt I had unfinished business there. I wouldn't say I want to live there, but the allure of it was very powerful. You know, and here it is, just sort of out in the middle of nowhere, you know, and it's like, you wouldn't think a thing like that could happen, and if it did happen, you would think it'd be kind of dead on the ground, like Fodipur Sikri, you know, and, or kind of half kilter like Brasilia. But no, it's really just kind of out there, nobody pays much attention to it, works kind of good, it's kind of a fortress against Chinese expansion. It's sort of in the middle of their belt and silt road thing, and it's just sort of saying, we're another version of modernity here. Snow all over the place, rockets flying overhead, very peculiar folk music, really interesting food, a lot of Tex-Mex in Astana. <laughs> It's the oil business, you know, a lot of oil guys in Astana. And you, you never hear about it. And it's not considered one of the world's model cities, but it's, it's an example of this kind of grandiosity that I'm describing. And it actually, it, I wouldn't say that it works or that this is the future. It's more like it's, a, uh, it's an option, right? It's a, it's a possibility. It's an existence proof. 
So here I am in Doha, Qatar. And people say that Doha is one of the dullest super cities in the world, and they're right. It's very dull in Doha. Like, a lot of buildings going on, but there just wasn't much going on in the town until Doha got involved in the Arab uprisings, and now they've got every conceivable kind of political trouble, and they're under siege from the Saudis, and the Turks hate them, and the, the Iranians hate them, and they're red-handed all over the Syrian difficulties, and, you know, I don't know what went wrong with these guys. It looked very peaceful and orderly there, and the high buildings did not save them. But this is Dubai, who I actually spend a lot of time studying Dubai. And one of the reasons I, I like them is they're kind of Doha, but less dull. I mean, the guys in Dubai actually have a kind of futurist charm offensive going on. And here you can see they're so into futurism that they're like inviting German futurists over to present in a kind of noblesse oblige. It's like, oh, you Germans, you have some ideas about the future. You're green, that's cute. <laughs> Why don't you come on by? You know, we'll, we'll show you how it's done. Right? And um, anyway, they have like the minister of happiness in Dubai. I mean, they're a very eccentric micro state, right? But with a very pronounced and a very peculiar ideology and very globally minded and very sophisticated as futurists. I mean, they're really kind of, they're really working it, right? As a kind of, um, you know, effort to wake other people up, and also as, a, as, a, as an effort to establish very firmly and the global eye that they're not Baghdad, and they're not Damascus, and they're not Cairo, and they're not Doha, and they're, they're not Riyadh. They're actually like a thing of their own, which is kind of poised not, not to dominate, but to be a kind of entrepot of futurity. I, I have friends who work for them. We spend a lot of time in... in, in, in um, in Dubai, you know, doing kind of strategic forecasting things or, or, or doing just bizarre experiments. They want their own hyperloop. They want their own drone taxis. They want their own 3D printed building. Uh, you know, I, I have friends who go and consult for the Dubai autocracy, Sheikh Mohammed and his crew of highly educated technocrats. And they say the worst problem they have is that if you if you tell them about some bizarre innovation, they immediately say, that sounds nice, give me a thousand of them. <laughs> Which is, you know, the kind of definitive Dubai attitude and something I kind of admire. I take them seriously, like more seriously than I do Singapore. And these other, they're, kind of, they're kind of unleashing a kind of um, charismatic energy of like pushing it beyond the limits of the sensible, right? And they're not even capitalists. They're, they're into this kind of happiness ideology of paternalistic, almost indescribable. But, you know, I, I don't expect them to end well, and I don't think they're like, <laughs> well, you know, 30 years is a long time. I wouldn't say they're going to be dominating the world in 30 years. I mean, I, they, they happen to have a capable technocrat shake running things, but they could easily come a cropper and have somebody else take power. That's the difficulty of terms of succession in an autocracy. Um, but they're very, very different from other Arab states, and, and deliberately so, and like getting more so. They're like becoming more eccentric faster, you know, and not in the particular sinister way that many other capitals around the world are. I mean, people are actually attracted to Dubai and uh, seem to, you know, be willing to take advantage of the services they're offering. I don't think there will be a Dubai like Dubai. I don't think Dubai will be the Dubai of the 2050s, but I think there will be a Dubai of the 2050s. And it will probably be something like this, something small, high tech, rich, ambitious, you know, and visionary, not even crazy, just like deliberately pushing the edge. I mean, there they are with their solar power. It's like, why do they need solar power? Okay, they got plenty of oil. They just like it to be visible from space. <laughs> just like, you got some solar power? I'll take a thousand of those. Okay? Just like, lots. And it works. They're selling power. They don't need the oil. They 
almost gave up on the oil at this point. Plenty of room for more. A lot of room, absolutely. Solar crashes, hit it up. They wouldn't hesitate to double this, triple this, quadruple it. No problem. They're thrilled. If you're happy, they're happy. So here we are, my wife and I, like last month in Estonia. So we went to the Estonia e-residency area because I happened to get like fan mail from these guys. And they're like, oh yeah, I love your books about globalism, Mr. Sterling, and we're like very cyber over here, and we think everybody should be living in Estonian cyberspace. And so we're like, we went over to talk to these guys in their Estonian office, and there they are. And that's their actual residency, which looks almost exactly like an office here at SciArc. This is a dead paper factory in the industrial zone of Tallinn. So there's like 13 hackers in there. And we had a very nice chat. We had like tea with the boss. He was like a you know, guy half my age, young, Western educated, technocratic Estonian guy. And you know, this is where we were drinking and this is where they're basically trying to get people to buy into their service which is about doing business from Estonia without actually ever being in Estonia. So what are they attempting to do? Well, you know, they don't want to be a money laundry or an offshore banking area. What they want to be is like an offshore administrative service. And if you're in, say, South Korea or Ukraine and you're outside the European Union, but you want to do digital business, like services, consultancy, code writing, any other kind of thing you would do on, say, a website, um, they will put you on their website, and they will also offer you banking services and give you all kinds of technical advice and help you incorporate. And it's a real corporation, really incorporated. You can, like, buy things, sell things, pay taxes to the Estonians. That's what they, they get out of it. Um, and, you know, if you, if you keep your money and your funding inside the Estonian thing, they don't tax you very much. On the contrary, they'll allow you to build your... It's only if you remove the money from the Estonian system that they then tax you and, like, take all this stuff. So, you know, our host was, like, very keen to, like, get this across to us. And, you know, naturally, being a journalist, I couldn't help teasing him. So I'm like, so, you know, what's to prevent the Russians from simply crushing all your stuff uh, with, a, you know, a brutal cyber war attack? And, uh, you know, you've been having all kinds of Russian attacks on your system for quite a while. Uh, what if they just, like, knock over your bank and take all, your, take all the money from all of your guys? And he says, well, you know, we, of course, we've been under attack for many years here. And, in fact, we've got NATO's cyber war center here in Tallinn, Estonia. And we're the world's best people at combating the ambitions of the Russians. And that's why we have our entire national government backed up in Luxembourg. <laughs> all of it. Every blood test, every genetic scan, every driver's license, every bank record has all been offshored from Estonia into Luxembourg. So the entirety of Estonian cyberspace, such as it is, is duplicated in Luxembourg, you know, with the permission of the Luxembourgeois, by the way, who understand their own community, you know, their, 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 their interests with a fellow European Union nation, they made a particular diplomatic arrangements so that the hardware and the servers in Luxembourg are considered part of Estonia's sovereign national situation. So, you know, I was discussing this with this guy at some length, and I realized he actually has an architecture problem. And I think this is an architecture problem which is probably going to be a big deal in 30 years. And it'll be a commonplace deal, but it'll also kind of be a big deal, right? So they merely need three different kinds of architectural services. First, they need some kind of offshored pop-up store where they sort of appear in South Korea and they sort of say, hi, we're Estonia. Like, let us show you what it's like to be virtually Estonian, you know, or whatever terminology they're using. Uh, but, but, but it needs to be a physical place, like, you know, an Apple plant or something, you know, a sort of the Apple store. Um, so that people are aware that they're like really Estonia and they're not just like a consultancy service. And then they need a registry area, which is much more like a bank or, a, uh, or an embassy, where you go in and do the very serious security measures which are necessary to actually be 
in an Estonian e-resident, which is being fingerprinted, iris scanned. They might draw your DNA. You have to sign over a bunch of stuff, come up with all these. And then they give you the, the Estonian e-residency card. Oh, well, it's in here somewhere. Um, and so forth. And then finally, they're going to need the kind of Estonian Apple HQ, uh, which is the actual representation within Estonia of this e-residency structure or service or website or whatever it is. I mean, this is, this is the Steve Jobs Theater. You know, it's the, the Norman Foster version of the Apple HQ. They need a prestige building if they have the 20 million customers they rather expect to get, or maybe 200 million, or maybe a couple of billion. Why not? I mean, make it, there's no reason they couldn't amp up their services and kind of spread them indefinitely. And uh, yeah, I don't understand how those problems are solved. I think they're very interesting problems. And I can easily imagine a situation in the 2040s and the 2050s where there are a lot of people who are in business who really are working very hard to kind of, what's the right word? Reconcile this inherent clash between having a place on the ground and a place to live. I mean, Rem Kulhas very accurately points out that the internet is in fact a gigantic physical structure. I mean, it's just huge barns out in Reno full of humming servers. You know, and that's also what Estonia has. I mean, Estonia is offering you this e-residency, but the actual e-residency are places that Russians can bomb. You know, or the, they're places that can be drowned by climate change or places that can be set on fire. So, you know, we have, to date, we have not begun to resolve this. There hasn't been a lot of money in it. The Estonians are trying to monetize it. They're like way into it. I mean, more so than the whole population's behind them. There are Estonians who are e-residents of Estonia, right? But you know what happens if you're an Estonian offshored e-resident of Estonia? It's like you're re only in Luxembourg. You know, it's like you can like, I don't know. I would like to help them. I don't want to be an e-resident of Estonia. I'm not a businessman. I'm a novelist. But I like, this is like a serious problem, right? And it's like, it's going to get worse or bigger or like have more money in it. So this is actual Estonia. This is like Tallinn downtown Tallinn. So I'm walking around Tallinn and I come across this particular structure, which is the uh, Linate, is that its right word? Or I have its name written here. Oh yes, this is the 1980 Lenin Palace of Culture and Sport from the 1980 Olympics. So, you know, I didn't know what it was. I'm simply walking around and I walk down the street and I see like this fantastic, horrifying ruin and I'm like, oh, I gotta go take pictures. So, you know, this is an actual existent Estonian megastructure. So this was built by some architect, a group of architects, in 1980, uh, you know, to celebrate the Soviet Union's glorious Olympic effort. And it's super typical to build big white elephant buildings during the Olympics. I mean, if you're, if you're gonna like splurge a lot of money and go build like really cool, enthusiastic things that people wave flags at, boy, the Olympics are hard to beat. And I can only imagine the Soviet guy, the architect, who got this plum job. You know, he must have come home to his wife and said, honey, you won't believe what the nomenclature has just asked me to do. It's like, what is it? Is it like another gulag? And I'm, no, no, it's not a jail at all. Is it like a nuclear submarine base like you built before? No, baby, no. It's a palace of culture and sport, a palace. A palace of culture and sport. And like the budget is fantastic. They're like laying, there's gonna be like foreigners all over the place. And I said, that is great. And I was like, yeah. It's like, you know, we've got like hundreds of millions. Look at the size of it. You know, and he's like laying out, rolling out the blueprints. And when he's really doing his heart, he's putting his heart in it. You know, I mean, this is like St. Peter's, he's probably from Petersburg, because it's right next to the Baltics. You go to Petersburg, you see these kind of giant flat plazas out in the marsh which is super Baltic. I mean, Petersburg's in the Baltic, so it's all flat and marshy. So you can like build these really long things. And, you know, and it's got like a little port at the end where you're supposed to put in like the racing ships because it's like a little kind of yacht thing going on there, like water skiing for the Olympics. And he's just, he's going at it hammer and tongs. He's like, he's like 
picked out a tasteful color of teal for the lighting, you know, and it's like, and like the girls with the ribbons, the kind of Olga Corbett brigade, you know, they're going to be like, Brendan, the lighting is great, and like they're doing the, tossing the hoops, you know, and it's like, it's kind of the music is thundering, and there's like, there's searchlights going on, it's like multi-level, he's going to, really, did, you can see the pleasure he took in drawing it. <laughs> And then somebody actually had to build it, you know, and this, this fascinates me in these Soviet structures because, you know, they could build anything, but not to any level of tolerance. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's for some, I never, I can't understand why, you know, and then I, I kind of finally figured out it was because it was basically the reward system. I mean, when you're putting the thing together, you're supposed to like get it to happen according to like the five-year plan. So it doesn't really matter all that much what it looks like, as long as it kind of gets up on time, not too much over budget. So, you know, if you're an architect or a builder and you're like coming in and you're like, I'm looking at this incredibly bad joinery, just, and you know, and this is the insides of the things, okay? So, you know, they're, they're literally just filled with rubble. I mean, he's just, okay. Somebody's looking at the blueprints and he's saying, okay, it's got to be a meter across. And, you know, it's, it's going to look okay on the outside because we, like, cast those already. It was like, what goes in them? Oh, it doesn't matter, Vladimir. Just toss it on in there. <laughs> Any, anything will do, you know. And, and, then, and then, like, the truth is laid out. You can see, see the guts of the thing. You know, and this is actual talent in the background. When the, and then the cranes are going at it, hammer and tongs, and they got the international mirror glass thing going, and everything seems groovy. But now they've got just like this fantastic eyesore. It's really, really big. You know, it's made out of ferro cement. All the lighting's been ripped out of it. The, it's, it's been gutted. It has a concert hall in it that'll seat 5,000 people. God only knows what that looked like. It must be full of mildew by now kind of flood, I mean, this is what actual talent looks like. I mean, that's, that's who they are. Oh, and here's my beloved offshore license here, which allows me to be e-resident. But, you know, I look at a thing like this, and this, you know, you wish to God the poor guy had just put up some circus tents. I mean, you know, nothing fails like a failed megastructure. You know, there's, there's a few, there's some parked cars kind of hidden under it. It's got like a garage built in it. You know, it, it's still called a music hall. Nobody performs. The, the gate to the music hall is covered with barbed wire. Even the barbed wire is rusting. It's, you know, graffiti bombed all over. And you know, imagine the money you would have to take just to knock this thing down, right? So, you know, and it's in, it's in a, a kind of a plum position in Tallinn, you know, and, and it wasn't even an, even an insult to them. It was not an attempt to dominate them militarily on the country. It's really an attempt to, like, it's like a Soviet charm offensive. It's really meant to be a palace of sport and culture with, like, singing and dancing and beautiful young people performing, you know, and yet it's just like this disaster, you know, it's just like, how, wow. I mean, they make head fakes about doing something with it. There's no way they're going to do it. How long will it be there? It's been there since 1980. So, you know, and will it be there in another 30 years? I mean, is this thing going to be like overgrown with more trees or whatever? And there in the mid 21st century, you know, unless really extraordinary efforts are taken, I think, yeah. You know, and also if the seas rise, so that this particular area is submerged or like, you know, um, subjected to nuisance flooding or, you know, just greenhouse effect stuff so that nobody's building on the shoreline. This is going to be underwater and it might be there for millennia. I mean, you know, the, the, the air, the ground will salt under it. The foundations will crack. The whole thing is extremely heavy. It's going to like settle. It'll be covered with slime, barnacles, just, you know, what a, what a mess, you know, and, 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 and really, like, I don't know, it, it's, a, it's a dark thing, you know, and it wasn't meant to be dark, I mean, it's not, it's not savage, it's not like the ruins of Hitler, it's just like a, it's, it's kind of like an extinct dead elephant, but, you know, there's just like the bones of it there, I, it, it troubles me, you know, and, and I think it will trouble the 21st century. I think there's going to be a lot of stuff we built that fails this badly. 
And we're going to be sorry that we didn't build it out of bamboo and paper mache, right? And, and, and stuff that was built with a good intent. You know, this architect may still be alive. I don't know his name. I don't want to shame him in public. I think he did the best job he could. I don't know. It's just, <laughs> there it is. I mean, yeah, there's an element of humor there, I guess, somewhere. I don't know. I mean, I, I just hope these mirror glass things don't look as shabby and kind of frightening as this guy's effort to cheer everybody up. So, you know, let's go on. I mean, what about this business of the 2050s and them doing stuff that nobody else does? Well, you know, if you talk to guys in Silicon Valley about this Estonian problem, it's like, how can I be virtual and of the country and not in the country and sort of have the advantages and not? They come up with a seasteading scheme. And, you know, this is a very old-fashioned idea, and I've been known to write about it in sci-fi novels. I've never seen it work. Um, I think the blimp is a giveaway. And any time there's a blimp in a forecasting situation, it's always bullshit, okay? <laughs> they never work. People always put them in there. You know, in theory, you could go out and sort of build something in the middle of the ocean, and the Chinese are building stuff in the middle of the ocean, right? I mean, like this... This uh, you know, fiery reef business is very much seasteading, only it's national seasteading. This is supposed to be you know, Peter Thiel, basically, going out and like, building his own private Amazonia in the middle of nowhere. I don't understand what happens I mean, when the seas rise or if it's hit by a Category 5. I, I just don't, I don't have a lot of enthusiasm for that scheme, although it used to attract me. I can understand why people would want to leave the United States. I mean, these were wildfires in the U.S. this year, and I don't think I'm bringing the, no the news to Los Angeles about what this is like. Uh, this is extremely sinister, and you know the, the landscape is being wrecked in front of our faces. And you know, by the mid 2050s, this is going to be very banal. I mean, it's just sort of accepted. For us, it's shocking. It's like, oh my gosh, we can't talk about the inconvenient truth. But you know, this is another generation's problem. And yeah, the seas are gonna rise, and yeah, a lot of stuff is gonna burn. And yeah, you know, it's like everything that was predicted in the 1980s and 1990s by well-informed climate scientists is gonna turn out to be an underestimation of what's actually going on on the ground in architecture. And under those circumstances, yeah, maybe you'd wanna move out to sea. I mean, especially if this is what London looks like. So, you know, here you get like Bre the capital of Brexitania, and like the water just like comes up. Okay, you know, that's not the way it actually works. I mean, this is four degrees C. This is like the late 21st century. But by the middle of the 21st century, it's going to be very obvious that this is what's coming, and they're going to be doing everything they can to kind of reverse it. So you see a certain amount of speculation on this subject already, which kind of has this attitude. It's like, oh, well, things are really bad. Let's go over and have a Starbucks about it. And then you've got kind of architectural solutionism, which is, you know, some guys here in Florida who are like, boy, Florida will be missed, uh, you know, when we're, when we're underwater, so let's, let's get some cheap style steel pilings and kind of like move our thing up. Okay, I can imagine doing this, and you know, this is an existent thing, but what happens to the neighborhood if everybody else doesn't do it? I mean, aren't you just like kind of stuck up there? <laughs> And I, mean, I don't want to ridicule it. I mean, yeah, at least this color TV is still working or whatever, but what kind of, you know, or, or this, you know, which is sort of very solutionistic. It's going to be like, well, you know, we kind of break down the problem into architectural things. We like do this and we do that and we can like do this or we can just kind of like prettify the flood. It's like it's really flooded now and like we're in a marsh. <laughs> so let's just kind of marsh it on up, you know? It's like we're just... We gotta kind of go with it, you know, and I, I appreciate the level of, uh, you know, intensity in this and the kind of, and, and, I, and I know that it's coming and I know that there's gonna be a lot of this going on in the mid-century, but I don't think it's gonna look like this, you know, it's just, it's kind of, it's not realistic. I mean, what it's gonna look like, and I think what a lot of the mid-21st century is gonna look like, this is Christiania. So, you know, I'm hanging out in Christiania in Denmark, which is a famous hippie colony, just taken over by squatters basically in 72. And you can see it's just like that dead thing in Tallinn. It's a, uh, a former military fortress, which is right on the water, run down, all the lighting broke, you know, nobody was living there. It's kind of a huge eyesore. And like in the 70s, a bunch of 
sprightly Danish hippies basically run into the place, they take it over by force of picket sign, more or less. And you know, if you try to dislodge them, they riot. So this is what like their furniture looks like. <laughs> and you know, I've been to Christiania many times. I always go by there, I take their moral temperature. They are the most conservative people in contemporary Copenhagen. Nothing has changed there since 1973. They are absolutely the most, I mean, they're, they're like, the Amish level by this point, really. <laughs> They're still listening to, listening to old uh, Bob Marley records in there, and you know, selling a hell of a lot of marijuana, which is, you know, basically their that and bicycles. That's their economic model. But you know, they're not bothered by it, which is kind of great. I mean, they really are outside contemporary capitalism, and you know, they're not exactly a squat. They're an alternative society. But so many dreams that people have about doing alternative things in the 21st century are already present in Christiania. It's just, it's what Christiania would be, right? I mean, it's, if you want to do that, and it sounds really great, like mass robot unemployment. People are like, what will we do? The robots have taken all the jobs. We become Christiania. <laughs> it's, it's that simple, you know, because they don't have jobs, and they don't want jobs. And if, if the robots come there, they don't care. It won't alter their lives in the least. That's, that's them. Uh, guaranteed annual income. Why don't we just give everybody guaranteed annual income? We'll transform society. It will transform society into Christiania. <laughs> everybody will just do what the people in Christiania have been doing since 1974. It's not that difficult. They know how to do it. It's OK. It's not scary, but nothing. Open source housing. We're going to build everything out of like cool scrap, and like we'll just democratize access to everything. And like everybody can make his own house with whatever he wants and just download the plants. Christiania. <laughs> it's absolutely them. They've got buildings in there that are made just entirely out of leftover windows. They've got elevators that are made out of old chicken coops. They can kind of make anything out of anything. Recycled scrap everything. They recycle everything. Cheap materials. It'll be a, a world of plenty. Okay, the pallet crate is the atomic unit of construction in Christiania. Everything's made out of zero worth pallet crates. They're just tons and tons of pallets. They make anything out of them chairs, tableware, anything you want. It's all there. And then the climate crisis favela and the planet of weeds scenario, where, you know, large areas are of are uninsurable and they're of kind of zero real estate worth because the sea just creeps in two or three times a year and kind of melts everything. So the police kind of leave and nobody's looking after it. But it's not really that bad because they have the Christiania ethic and this is the Christiania ethic which is basically saying do not turn us into a narco terror state. Don't bring in any heroin or any guns. So if you manage to keep the heroin and the guns out, and you're also basically Somalia, then you become Christiania. And a lot of these areas that go underwater, they're not going to be up on stilts. They're not going to be in eco marshes. They're, not, they're going to become Christianias. They're going to be a wet favela around the world, you know, as the seas rise. And the issue is not like how you stop, how, that you like change those areas. I mean, if, if you could live on water, people would have already moved out onto piers. I mean, Los Angeles would go out into the Pacific for half a kilometer or so if it were cheap or easy to do. What's going to happen is that things are just going to get wet, moldy, fall apart, be repeatedly flooded, but they will have people in them. And the people in them will, in a good case scenario, they will behave like people of Christiania. And that's a lot of real estate, right? And it's an alternate society living in these flooded zones. And, now, and by the mid-21st century, I think people are going to be very aware of that. They're going to be, they're, they're, they're kind of the new inner city in some ways, because you can't really fix them. They're there. There's a whole lot of installed base. Nobody repairs it. I mean, flooded areas frequently catch fire, too. Uh, you, you can't really move buildings through it. But you know, just try to get your head around what it would mean. Okay. I know what they'll do. They're not going to repair that. What they're going to do is like spend as much money as they can on carbon sequestration and attempt to like lose less. Right? I mean, you need to stop the sea from rising. You can't go out and build into the rising sea. You've got to 
turn your attention to saving the rest of the installed base. You're going to have to write off the drowned stuff. But then somebody's in the drowned stuff. And you know, what does that life look like? It doesn't look like this. It looks, it looks like this. It might look a little bit like this, which is, you know, plans for smart cities. And there's, there's a lot of smart city talk now, but there won't be any in the, mid, in the 2050s. I mean, everything that can be done will have been done, and, you know, it's not going to be Oz or a singularity or anything. I think it's going to be mostly like this. There'll be, you know, kind of add-ons clipped on to the existing architectural base. Um, if you ever saw Blade Runner, where the guys are sort of retrofitting the parking meters, this is what actually works in smart city stuff. If you put smart city stuff down at street level, the seven-year-olds will rip it to pieces. Or, you know, people will just hit it with baseball bats. It'll be vandalized. You have to put it up where people can't reach it, and then you have to periodically upgrade it and get rid of the stuff that's no longer supported by the guys who sold it to you. I, I spend a lot of time on this subject. Maybe we get to the smarter homes. We have one of these in Torino. We've got our experimental open source smart home. In, in an abandoned factory in Turin, which is not an abandoned shipping plant for the railway like your school here. It's actually uh, an abandoned Fiat forge. It's a foundry. But believe me, I spend a whole lot of time under circumstances like this, and so does everybody else in Italy. Uh, you know, this is like what's really exciting to us now. It's like we're watching the the new majors take over, the old guys. Okay, 30 years from now, this is extremely old news. I, I, I doubt that any of these companies will be alive. They'll be replaced by, they're gonna, you know, they'll be disrupted as they disrupted somebody else. And, uh, you know, our, our excitement for this is like a period thing. This is, this is our version of Googie architecture, really. It's our cyberspace age. Um, I can't tell you how much people in Barcelona hate Silicon Valley's idea of smart cities. I hang out in Barcelona rather a lot. They're just in rebellion against Uber. They despise um, the, the rental people. Oh, uh, gosh, what are their names? Yes, them. Uh, Airbnb. Uh, they, they loathe Airbnb and Uber. And, but they're a very high-tech city. What they really, uh, you know, resent is Silicon Valley cultural imperialism. And there, there's going to be a lot more of that. I mean, people are just going to blow back uh, on this. I don't think Barcelona is going to win because Barcelona never wins. But Barcelona is always a signifier of something. And there's going to be a Barcelona around in 30 years. And they're going to be dancing on the bones of Uber and Airbnb, you know, one way or the other. Um, you know, in Silicon Valley, you don't see this kind of mass resentment, but in Barcelona, in Turin even, they can't stand them. They're just, they're, they're fed up with them. So there's going to be epic struggle over this, and there's going to be some kind of settlement and, you know, something else going on. Okay, this is an issue that I think is underestimated in futurism, which is, you know, what are the most famous buildings in the 2050s? The most famous buildings in the 2050s already exist. They're famous old buildings, right? I mean, the, the, the buildings on the planet that you're most treasured are antique buildings. So this is the guy in Turin who's like inventing Turinese architectural tourism. His name's Alfredo D'Andrade. He's a Portuguese guy, but for some reason he's very taken with Turinese architecture. So here you've got D'Andrade doing a thing which fascinates me. He's going out and he's looking at this medieval door hardware which some illiterate guy built with his hands. And he's like really bringing that full analytical power of the 19th century onto the 14th century. He's like, man, I can rebuild this. And I'm going to do it better, right? It's like, I've read Violet Le Duc, you know? I'm like, I'm going to like, through an act of romantic nationalism, I'm going to take this crumbling 600-year-old building and turn it into like a perfect version of itself. Right? It's like something that's like a monument instead of just like this thing that a guy kind of banged out on a weekend. And I think this is what we're going to do in the mid-21st century. You're going to see a lot of smart city efforts which are based on buildings, threatened buildings, buildings under decay, retrofits like this. Just, there's so much on the ground, so much to do. 
you know, and, and his work was a great success. I really admire him. I consider him one of my spiritual ancestors, this, this guy, Don Drade. You know, and, it, and, and it's because he's like, he's just thinking it through from another historical perspective. You know, and often this just blows. I mean, you, you dig up some piece of the past and you're like, oh, we must valorize it. You know, and then your valorization like lasts like a weekend, right? Because here's like the oldest piece of rock in London has like got anything written on it and the Londoners are like, this is great. Like, let's write thing, our thing. And it's like, they're, 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 I mean, their work there is the part on the, you know, on, on the right, which is already destroyed by people's footsteps, right? I mean, the past is still there. The Roman past is still fine. It's just our contemporary attempt to valorize the Roman past is like what's blown to pieces. And, you know, we're going to do a lot of that. You know, and I find that hilarious. And there's something, I mean, that's atemporality. That really speaks to a science fiction writer in some ways. I'm fascinated by this. Okay, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in Turin. They asked us to go there, my wife and myself. You know, sometimes I write science fiction in turn, but mostly I just do really weird stuff. It's, you know, so I've come to understand the nature of the Italian built environment and what it promises for other people. And, you know, these are the most famous buildings in Italy, and these are almost certainly going to be the most famous buildings in Italy in the 2050s. It wouldn't be surprising if they were the most famous buildings in Italy in the 2300s. They just kind of froze them, right? is UNESCO World Heritage Sites. You can't really do much with them. I mean, you can preserve them to a certain extent, but you know, the laws of physics say that you can't preserve them perfectly. And, you know, and Violet Duke understood this. You know, and in the 21st century, I think people are gonna like, tackle this problem in some new way. They're gonna like, find some way to, like, they won't destroy the buildings, but they've gotta find some better way to understand what happens to the architectural built environment or how to preserve them when the thunderbolts might hit them, you know? They could be hit by a Category 5, and they're under threat, you know, and the, nature, the natural world is under threat. And the stuff that we build that we admire is going to be very difficult to keep up. I mean, people love these Gary Blob texture buildings, and, you know, in Los Angeles, is speckled all over with these things. He's an L.A. guy. Imagine yourself in the mid-21st century, you're like, okay, what particular CADIA program do I have to boot up to like figure out how to like replace the curvature of this particular titanium thing, right? Because they're going to decay. I mean, even though they're digital, they're still going to decay. You know, what happens if they're just hit with a really severe hailstorm? I mean, how do you keep them up? Okay, this is artificial intelligence. You know, people are like very keen on this. Suddenly, it's like the vogue of whatever neural nets, deep learner. Okay, this is a deep learner trying to like build some chairs. <laughs> I'm not super impressed. And I, I don't think they're going to do that. I, you know, I actually like this kind of stuff. I mean, I like generative art. Um, I think these are interesting chairs. I like it that they're post human and kind of non functional. I mean, they. they I mean, this is a new space, right? I mean, it's like a genuine kind of novelty. It's, uh, you know, it, it's what uh, James Bridal would call the new aesthetic. And I think this kind of, you know, creative works by non-human actors. We're going to see a lot of them, but they don't understand what's going on. I mean, if you're talking to an AI architect in the mid-21st century, I think he will be able to design you a million possible chairs and allow you to pick. But if you sort of say, what's the tenor of the times? I mean, what's, what's important now? What should we be building? I mean, what's the right thing to do now? They will have no clue. They, won't be able, they will be able to recite you something from Wikipedia, but they won't have any, any understanding of that. So, you know, I, I watch this, but I watch it with a kind of, I don't know, wistfulness, really. Um, it's like watching a kaleidoscope. It's like turning a kaleidoscope and seeing the most pretty thing you ever saw, and then you give it the one extra twist and it's just chaos. You know, and that's, that's what neural net hardware is like. It's like, wow, what a great accident. Here's some guys at Space 10, you know, which is the IKEA research arm in Copenhagen. We were just there in the Copenhagen meatpacking district. That's why we're hanging out in Christiania. So they're trying to forecast like the encounter between autonomous vehicles and architecture. 
Like what happens if you've got just like autonomous architecture? Like this is a food truck. Okay, you know, if we're gonna do this at all, there's gonna be a lot of this in the mid 21st century, like the 2040s, 2050s, it's just like, where's the living room? Oh, I sent it out. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, which sounds weird to us, you know, but this kind of potential fluidity of just like shelving off parts of the built space, putting them on wheels and kind of moving them around, or just having the wheels show up, jack up something and kind of haul that away. Okay, we were never able to do that, and I think we're going to be able to do kind of a lot of it. You know, and probably in fluid ways that we don't understand. And, you know, there's a ton of kind of, uh, I don't know, I mean, L.A.'s got car written all over it. But L.A. with autonomous cars would really be a very different kind of place. I mean, different in ways that the term autonomous car does not immediately come across. I mean, di different in a deeper way. I mean, autonomous car is to car as um, phone is to cell phone or smartphone, right? So you know, I, I don't see Oz here, but I think there's a lot of, you're, you're, if this happens at all, your, your profession is going to be very busy with this. I mean, it really would mean a lot to you. It's going to just make a very big fuss. You know, and, and I'm going to close here, you know, with this kind of eternal sci-fi vision. I mean, this is like the city in the sky, you know, like the city of Laputa. And, you know, it's an aerostat, basically, and it's a blimp, you know, and I say that the blimps are always bullshit. But, you know, I don't think the aerostats are actually bullshit. I mean, this is like the Buckminster Fuller sphere, which you build, and it's like a couple of kilometers across, and it just like goes up into the atmosphere, and then you just sort of live in it. I mean, you have an interior sphere, which is pressurized, and then you have the outer sphere, which is a little bit lighter. And, you know, if you build it to the proper proportions, um, it can just sort of take off from solar heating and go on up there. Okay, if we could do such a thing, and the physics would, I think, work, I'm pretty sure it would be physically possible to build stuff like that by the mid-century. And, you know, I, I speculate, it's like, why? I mean, why would anybody want to live in midair? I mean, it sounds like really kind of crazy. And especially, like, why would you want to live in midair in a very troubled atmosphere? But then I think to myself, why would you want to live on the Earth's surface if you really didn't like being in the Anthropocene? I mean, if you felt that, like, humanity had failed in some way and that the Earth had been tainted by the failures of the past and you really wanted a profoundly different way of life that was like you knew you could not go back to nature because nature had been obliterated by calamity, and you yourself didn't want to be human. You were keen on being transhuman or posthuman, and you wanted to live in some kind of built environment that was just radically divorced from everything that mankind had ever done before. Okay, under those conditions, a giant aerostat just floating up in the sky would be a very powerful gesture, I think. And I imagine them as jet black. You know, just kind of black nanocarbon sheeting. And they just kind of come over the horizon like the Death Star. And they kind of float around like a Google loon, if you've seen these, you know, the kind of autonomous aerial things that Google builds to repeat things. And they, you can go up there on a drone, you know, nobody can see you in there. The kind of radar blind, God only knows what they're up to in there. There aren't a lot of them. They're an elite. They're rich. They're beyond, they, they've got the money, but they have no soil. They don't care about soil. They could go to the moon, right? And settle the moon and have like a lunar colony, which is a very standard sci-fi kind of thing to say. Um, but to build an aerostat would be about 10,000 times cheaper, a lot easier to do politically. It'd be a lot easier to leave. It'd be a lot less dangerous. And I think it would have a lot of the same payoff. Now, eventually, maybe by the end of the 21st century, it's going to be really cheap to go into outer space. And we've never been in a situation where that happened. I don't know how it will happen, but I just think it's, it's likely. 
And then we're going to be in a situation where we kind of settle other planets through a sense of embarrassment. Oh, and this is like a sensibility that nobody's ever thought of before. I mean, it's just nothing that ever occurred. It, it's always the idea, it's like, we're gonna go, we're gonna go colonize them. We're gonna like, do this, do that. Okay, my feeling is probably people will send robots out. They'll start chipping off pieces of asteroid. They might bring back some valuable metal. There'd be business in space. I mean, there's stuff to do out there. It's very difficult to live in space. To live in an aerostat gives you most of the kick. But eventually, people are probably going to go. And, you know, and I'm thinking of them going with a heavy heart, really. Right? I mean, with a genuine 21st century attitude of like, I guess it's time for this to happen. You know, I just, uh, they've been taught, I've just got to do it, you know. It's, it's got to, you know, and, and, and I, you know, it's an atmosphere of, of cosmic Weltschmerz, right? And you know, one reason to do it is because there is nature left in the solar system. There's just none on Earth. I mean, in the Anthropocene world, nature is over, but the nature on the moon isn't over. The nature on the sun's surface isn't over. We haven't polluted the entire galaxy. We've just like really fouled our nest on one particular planet. So if you were super dedicated to getting away from that, you could go live on an asteroid and try and do what you liked. But you know, an aerostat might be a better idea. And it would be doable, I think, in 30 years. I mean, I'm a little surprised that Elon Musk doesn't talk more about them. They're a bit more popular. You know, you know and this is Los Angeles 30 years ago. I mean, these are guys, this is the LA Forum Reader, which has like been talking about doing stuff in your town here for 30 years. You know, and 30 years ago, people did not take LA urban theorists seriously. I just thought, well, LA is not even really a town. I mean, it's just like a bunch of weird villages and hamburger joints on the side of this sort of huge highway snarl. But, you know, and then if you go and read this, and so you read these things, you sort of see these architects say, well, wait a minute, that's not true at all. We've actually got a new, diff different kind of better way of life here. And, like, we can, like, do, like, cool stuff. We've got, like, aerospace. And I was like, and there, there are computers. Have you heard of them? And I was like, you know, and, and, and 30 years is a long time, but it's not that long a time. I mean, we're talking about the same length of debate that you've got here and, and the same profession, you know, and the same people doing it. I mean, we're basically talking volume two of the LA Reader is the middle of this century. And, you know, what are you going to say about things? Well, I think you've actually got kind of a lot to say, right? I mean, you've actually got an interesting, an interesting problem. You know, and I have interesting problems, too. So, you know, I was engaged in this scheme, in this dead factory in Turin, this Casa Yasmina structure, which is in the same building with the Torino Fab Lab and the uh, Arduino light electronics thing and, and a de uh, design co-working space called Toolbox. So, you know, in, in Turin, we do a lot of electronic art. My wife and I were both directors of Share Festival, which is an art fair in Turin, the people who first asked us to come there. So, you know, we, we hang out with these people. I mean, these are the people who are in our milieu. And, and I mean, this is the cyber culture scene in Turin. So, you know, we, we just happily go in there and we're like tinkering, knocking stuff down, blasting things. We got hammers, we got, you know, we're, we're ripping, we're tearing, we're like furnishing stuff, you know, writing about it. We're like in the Italian press, we're really keen on it. So, you know, we've kind of finished our project there of retrofitting this this little factory. And then like some of our financial sponsors from our, from our art fair came by and they said, well, you know, Bruce, Yasmina, we've got this issue, you know, we've got like this palace up in the hills here and it's built in the 1640s and uh, we're moving out and we don't have any tenants. And you know, you, you did such a great job with this empty factory. Why don't you see what you could do with like this palace? So we now occupy this palace and we're the only tenants of this palace. And now we're literally in there and we're like writing novels up in the attic. Because we're like up in the attic, it's like, look, we've got a great garret. And they're like, why don't you just move in? And we're like, oh, well, shall we be residents in the palace? And they're like, yes, that would be fine. And it's like, well, what do you need in this palace? Well, you know, ideally we need like a non-governmental organization that can spend 150 grand a year mowing the lawn and repairing the palace. But, you know, the two of you will be fine. You can just, like, be up there, and you'll be our guest, and you don't have to pay rent, and, you know, we won't pay you anything, and you can just, like, enjoy the palace, you know. 
hang on, we've got paintings, we've got statuary, we've got curtains, you know, it's, it's a palace. And we now, like, are in this palace. And, you know, I'm really bothered by this. I mean, I can't do much with the palace, but, you know, I recognize this as a kind of karma for me. Because here I am showing up as, like, this American cyberpunk guy in Italy. And I'm like, let's just, like, digitize it. You know, let's, like, screw with it here. You know, like, let's break every rule. And you know, I think outside the box. And now this is like my box. And you know, this is like a 375 year old box and I can't, you know, and I'm in it and I'm not gonna be in it very long, but I feel like um, I'm like being taught some kind of important social lesson here. It's like, what the hell am I supposed to do alone in this palace? You know, and I can like write a novel in there. And I, you know, I, I guarantee you in 375 years, if I'm remembered at all, it will be because of text. It's not going to be because I had, you know, an Apple IIe at one point. I mean, that, that will all be very forgotten. If there's anything left of me, it will be words in some kind of medium. So, you know, I don't, I don't downplay the idea of writing a novel in a palace. I mean, I am writing a novel in a palace. But what bothers me is my relationship to the built environment of Turin. It's like, okay, I'm in Turin, and I was, like, in this wrecked place, and now I'm in, like, this kind of semi-sacred kind of place even though I know that the people who built it were in more trouble than I am. I mean, I actually, I know a lot about the history of 17th century Turin, because that's when they built most of the town. And as, as a person who's like a student of cities, architecture, activism, I know that the mortal human beings who built this thing made it look like this because they were afraid. It was the height of the Thirty Years' War. The Black Death was there. The city had been depopulated. This is the aunt of Louis XIV who built this thing. She had all kinds of personal troubles, war, bloodshed, uprisings, palace coups. Her husband was poisoned. Her dad was stabbed in the street. This was her boyfriend's hangout. This is where she stashed her lover. You know, and, and we're like haunted by the ghosts of these people. They're like intimates of ours now. You know, and I recognize this as a literary problem, but it's also an architectural problem and really a cultural problem and something that I can't tackle without knowing architecture better. You know, it's really a literary architectural problem. So, you know, here we are trying to find a tenant for our palace. It's like, drop on by if you've got a couple of hundred grand and you, you want to move into this place. Beautiful gardens. It's very nice. Fabulous palace. Really a palace. I'm really in there. I don't sleep there, but, you know, it's, it's, it's my office. We, every time we visit Turin, we go there. We kind of miss it now, you know. We need, we need an NGO to take over our palace. Feel free to tell all your friends. I mean, this would be our victory condition if we managed to get them a tenant. But, you know, for the moment, we are the tenants. And somehow, that's, like, really a problem. And I want to tell you what I do in my office, because here I am. So, you know, I was trying to furnish my office, so I'm going through the attic and the basement. And, oh, my God, the crap they've got in there. So, you know, I'm looking at these bizarre things, some of them 300 years old. I mean, I got a 300-year-old table, and then I see this ghost wrapped in plastic, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Isn't that a Charles and Ray Eames Ottoman in lounge chair? And, like, my hostess there says, oh, yeah. Is that what that's called? Yeah, you're a former director. He, like, used to live in that thing, and then he, like, retired five years ago, and nobody's touched that chair since. You know, it must be a ruin by now. It must be covered with mildew. I'm like, no way! Charles and Raeves, this is Los Angeles, mid-century modern quality. This is like a famous piece of furniture. So, you know, I took the thing and I kind of wiped it off with some paper towels. There was nothing wrong with it. It's in excellent condition. This is me in my Turinese palace, pondering the past, in my piece of Los Angeles cultural imperialism. I think about it in Los Angeles, and you know this is a great damn chair. You can get it, you can, you can buy it off Amazon. Charles and Ray didn't know that, you know, Amazon was going to be there, but by golly, they did some quality design work on this thing. That is one hell of a chair. I, you know, I never used one before, but I'm just like studying the heck out of it. It is my great consolation in this weird structure, you know. God bless them. God bless Los Angeles, and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you.